on behalf of uh, the Baha'i Chair for Studies in Development, I would like to warmly welcome Professor Keshav Das, our distinguished speaker for today, and all our participants who are joining us on Zoom as well as on Facebook for this lecture, which is part of the series that the Baha'i Chair has been organizing titled Dialogues on Development. Uh, the, the theme of today's lecture, which is a very important and pertinent one for our country, is crafts, clusters, and institutional innovation, thoughts for policy. The craft sector in India has remained one of the most neglected domains of local economic regeneration and job creation. There has been little attempt to build a competitive labor intensive non farm sector, mostly comprising the ubiquitous craft sector, which consists of handlooms and handicrafts. This has been unfortunate as the growth and diversification of farming activities have been unimpressive. The relegation of crafts, including artisan enterprises, rated as the largest source of employment following agriculture has remained a sad episode in employment and enterprise planning in both rural and urban India, with home to possibly the largest number of craft clusters in the world. The craft sector in India has received little attention in terms of creating an innovative ethos, diversification of products, organizing key raw materials through, such as through input banks, product promotion, and exploring newer markets, including global ones. These efforts would involve an approach of internalizing inclusive innovation wherein the producers occupy center stage in a participative framework of engaging with various aspects of business development, cluster specific and generic infrastructure that would facilitate building new skills to enhance labor productivity. Uh, the lecture today engages with the craft sector with the dual perspective of business development and creation of sustainable jobs through an ecosystem of inclusive innovation, where skill formation and selective technological upgradation would be attained through a combination of traditional and new knowledge. There will be an attempt to critique and contribute to policy discourse on rendering the craft sector an important source of local income and employment. Lessons of innovative initiatives from a few Asian nations would also be discussed. Our speaker today, Professor Keshav Das, is Dean at the School of Social, Financial, and Human Sciences at the KIIT deemed to be university in Bhubaneswar. <clears throat> professor Das is also a visiting professor with the Institute for Human Development at in New Delhi. Um, he is the recipient of the VKRV Rao Prize in Social Sciences. He is a former president of the Orissa Economic Association and the edit editor-in-chief of the Orissa Economic Journal. His research and policy engagement concern issues in local and regional development industrialization strategies, informal sectors, MSMEs, industrial clusters, innovation, labor, infrastructure, and the politics of development. Friends, without taking more time, uh, uh, I would like to invite Professor Das 
to uh, share with us his presentation. Just one uh, reminder before we begin to our participants across the different platforms, please share your questions and comments which are meant for Professor Das in the Q&A box in case you are uh, joining by Zoom. Otherwise, uh, in the comments uh, 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 section on Facebook. And after Professor Das has made his presentation, we will have time to share these with him and get his comments on them. Over to you, Professor Das. Uh, uh, thank you so very much, uh, Professor Aras. Um, uh, it's, it's a huge opportunity for me uh, because I have also seen uh, the list of previous uh, speakers, uh, some of whom are great friends of mine, and also some of them uh, are also teachers and from whom I have learned. So uh, I'm quite humbled to be a part of this event. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I'm somewhat uh, satisfied that uh, a topic like this um, uh, is, 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 is put on table. Uh, because this is uh, not uh, a sector about which uh, much uh, is really uh, known, discussed, even if uh, it seems to be a very familiar uh, subject. Uh, so I, what I'll do is, I so let me uh, share, my, uh, share, please. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, maybe I will make it. Uh, yes. Uh, so... Uh, so my uh, simple uh, uh, beginning uh, will be uh, uh, will be about uh, the kind of the context in which we are uh, talking about this sector when we are into the 21st century talking of globalization uh, and sort of like we are into uh, high technology uh, sphere. Uh, so so is there actually a need to talk about a sector uh, like this? Uh, maybe I think there is a huge need for that. Uh, for, a, for, for, for the simple reason uh, that uh, we are still a very much an agrarian uh, economy, but then also we know for decades, uh, so this is the farm sector is something which is uh, yet to cross, let's say, a kind of a 4% annual uh, growth rate. And there have been a very, very large uh, share of uh, sort of uh, people, uh, particularly in rural areas, uh, who are dependent on uh, farming or agriculture, but, uh, but, a, but a huge share of them are either marginal or small farmers, uh, or, or, you can, or many of them are landless uh, households. Uh, so you are talking about a kind of a huge population uh, spread across uh, the geography of uh, this country who depend on uh, agriculture, but then neither uh, the farm sector is growing very well, nor quite well diversified, and we also know uh, that this is uh, also a sector in which many people do not own land. So you essentially have to talk about what kind of non-farm uh, sector opportunities uh, we have for them. And even if those who are engaged in agriculture, so these are also not uh, keeping them engaged the whole year, maybe for three or four or five months. Uh, so there are times when uh, a large number of such people are, are sort of waiting to get employment or they sort of choose uh, the rather desperate option to move to uh, urban areas where they are least welcome and very little paid. And uh, we, as you saw uh, during the COVID times, uh, the plight of a large number of workers walking back and without very little support. So with that background, and also given that we have, if you're focusing on non-farm activity as kind of an alternative for local income and uh, employment generation, uh, so like using let's say local resources, local skills, uh, local uh, sort of markets, uh, then we know that we also have a fairly large, uh, what you may call as a kind of a craft uh, sector. By craft, including both handlooms and uh, handicrafts, so artisanal uh, enterprises, uh, and uh, sort of, uh, and of, of some kind of an estimation which tells us about 6,400 clusters uh, in this country, so about maybe 6,000 are uh, into handlooms and handicrafts, maybe half of them, like about 3,000 into handlooms and 3,000 in handicrafts spread all over the geography of this uh, of this country. And uh, within that, and then from a variety of anecdotal uh, information, we also know because there is very little in data available on this sector about which I'll be talking very soon, 
Uh, so there have been sort of several crafts which have been languishing, which have been dead, and there is very little hope uh, for these crafts to move forward. Uh, I don't know, I guess. Uh, so, so this is the kind of uh, information that we have uh, for the rural uh, sector in which the employment uh, in the in, in agriculture has been on the decline, the blue line uh, at the top, and it is the non-farm sector which seems to uh, have some uh, hope for uh, creating local jobs and uh, not very different for uh, for females uh, in, 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 the, in the agriculture sector, though uh, they have not quite moved out of it, and so they, they are still there. But again, the non-farm sector is something which probably engages them. But we also know that uh, this non-farm sector is largely sort of uh, comprised of the tertiary sector, the construction uh, particularly, and uh, not much has happened in terms of manufacturing. And if that's where we sort of bring in, uh, let's say, much of the crafts uh, here. And uh, the, the more uh, disturbing sort of fact, uh, as you see from this agricultural census uh, data, that there has been actually a definite rise and a rise of what you may call as the marginal uh, and uh, uh, from the, the marginal uh, farmers uh, over the decades. Uh, so which is a very, very disturbing term, uh, suggesting that unless we sort of find, we in the sense, unless the policy sort of makes enough efforts uh, to create uh, opportunities for uh, sort of jobs in the local places, uh, uh, the, the life of uh, a large number of such people will be uh, in, in trouble. Uh, and as with this kind of a background of very disturbing rise of the marginal uh, sort of uh, workers, uh, disturbing rise of the informal workers, and uh, sort of, uh, and 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 many women who are probably not gainfully uh, engaged. Uh, you also have a history of a kind of a, what I call as a policy pathy uh, to rural uh, industrialization. This is irrespective of our talks about rural uh, development and the varieties of schemes that we sort of uh, have uh, discussed. And I think since um, in, 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 the, in the early uh, decades uh, of planning era, when we were sort of maybe we have talked about working on uh, two legs. Uh, but then uh, we also know that the rural, the micro, small enterprises, those are particularly based on the craft sector, uh, so they uh, were clamoring for attention, and there is very little which they have received uh, in terms of the state uh, support. And, uh, and I've just given some kind of small little example from uh, a kind of a, a study in uh, 1976, saying that uh, we consider village industries as something primitive, which the urban power elite neglect ridicule, an enterprising land speculator will easily get a credit of rupees 10 crores to build a luxury hotel, but no bank will give even rupees 10 lakh to Ambar Zarkas, which stand between semi starvation and two modest meals a day. So we are talking about a sector uh, which is uh, which is absolutely uh, sort of sidelined by policy for decades. That is, it was, it's not it's not the story of today or the last decade. I think for from from the very beginning we have probably, and particularly since the second five year plan, I think we have really in neglecting this, uh, what you call the, the craft sector. One of the major issues that sort of remains, uh, uh, and about which we'll be talking uh, a little later again, uh, is this whole question about like, who is sort of taking a kind of a sectoral uh, approach uh, to this craft sector, and, uh, and, and, and if at all, uh, there is maybe a little talk about providing certain kinds of financial uh, services through banks, but then we know that a large number of these enterprises sort of fall in the domain of uh, informality, so they would not uh, be eligible to access several of these uh, loans uh, that were just uh, maybe available in, in some places. Uh, but the, the, the larger issue, uh, if you're talking about like craft clusters, for instance, like these kind of regions or the spaces in which these crafts are sort of co-located, uh, so we have to talk about the infrastructure or what is also sort of described as real services, certain kinds of business-centric sort of uh, cluster-centric uh, infrastructure, uh, which sort of also uh, needs to be linked to the larger innovation systems, larger markets. Uh, and this cannot be sort of seen in terms of like a kind of a poverty eradication uh, uh, approach by sort of organizing a few hearts in a year or sort of giving little uh, reward to a craft person. Uh, and so th and beyond that, we really talk about what kind of spatial infirmities are there which are completely hinder business because for us it may be a, the crafts may be a matter of let's say our tradition our heritage we feel proud about that but actually those who are engaged in that for them it's actually a livelihood option so it is a business proposition so which requires certain kinds of basic uh, sort of investment and uh, we also know 
that uh, uh, despite all our talks, uh, we have really uh, neglected this sector. And in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, just a moment. Uh, and and in terms of uh, uh, support, uh, there has been yes, uh, there has been very little which has come uh, in terms of uh, in terms of either identifying which are the crafts to be included and also in terms of financial uh, support uh, that they receive. And as you can see, uh, that it's very sort of, uh, even the, the, the Development Commission on Handicrafts, uh, which is coming under the Ministry of Textiles, uh, so they are sort of like very sort of broadly uh, defined. And, uh, and, and as, as you can see, uh, there are several so-called non-traditional craft products, uh, so which like, for instance, uh, like I've just given some examples from Gujarat, like for instance, kite making, rakhi, emboss painting, rogan art, etc. So these are not actually even included in the crafts, irrespective of whatever little support they might be getting. But then to really see, uh, even in terms of the financial uh, support uh, to this craft sector, I mean, I've just given data from this from the RBA and uh, 1995 to 2013. This is essentially the post uh, reforms period. So there has been absolute drop. Uh, in uh, the share of village industries uh, uh, as uh, 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 as part of the gross uh, bank uh, credit, uh, so 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 the village industries in general and within that the crafts uh, I think have not probably uh, receiving uh, adequate financial service the minimum uh, that we could have probably ensured. And from there, sort of I have identified let's say kind of a five I call it five S uh, in whichever way you may take it. Uh, sort of kind of a, the what the, the kinds of uh, the, the forms of exclusion uh, that's, that this uh, rural uh, craft uh, sector faces, it is very like certain, uh, as I've given the spatial, sectoral, systemic, seasonal, and statistical. Uh, I do not want to uh, describe uh, uh, too much into that. That's all in the slide. Uh, but I would like to sort of uh, make a little mention about the last one, that is the statistical uh, exclusion, uh, a kind of a complete neglect of uh, sort of efforts uh, to collect data uh, on this uh, 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 on this sector, uh, and also sort of making that uh, ever uh, uh, collected, making that public, and this uh, this this statistical exclusion that this sector faces, apart from several other the sectoral, seasonal, systemic, spatial, etc. I think this is one of the key issues that I'll be sort of harping on uh, because this is where I think policy. Uh, comes in and you cannot really talk about a sector about which you know nothing and we do not know how many crafts are there uh, in, in India for instance we do not know how many artisans are actually involved we do not know anything about their markets we do not know anything about their technology and and and, and the variety of uh, issues uh, about this sector because this data is just not there and particularly if you should talk about the handicrafts uh, the, the, in, in the post-independent India the only time ever uh, a census was done was in 1995, 96, and that's all. I mean, we we just have a, a census done only once in the last whatever 70 years now, and then uh, of course for handicrafts, uh, handlooms, uh, we have sort of four censuses, and there have been sort of essentially conflicting uh, sort of data on even even to know about what is just a mere a simple question about uh, how many people may be engaged in this, and these are sort of like. Different, uh, there's a craft council of India uh, data and uh, and some census data, NSS data. So there have been a few studies uh, which have compared. And for a given, let's say, a year or a given uh, time point, uh, there have been highly diverse uh, data source uh, uh, in terms of even the number of people uh, engaged. And in economic census in 2013, uh, so there has been sort of a kind of a two questions were added. Uh, that is uh, to to extract information on the number of artisans. That is. So two questions relating to those engaged in the craft for the uh, 100, last 180 days or more, and those who are directly responsible for sales and product. But then this data uh, still uh, is, is is not very uh, reliable. Uh, and as you even know, that even in the in the in the pre uh, independent uh, independence uh, period, uh, the censuses, uh, let's say the census of 1931, for instance, 1911, for instance, 1921, for instance. Uh, so they also largely and significantly missed out on the contribution of women, uh, uh, women artisans uh, in the in, in this uh, large uh, sector. And there have been several sort of crafts 
whether it's sort of wood, metal, stone, uh, uh, bamboo belt, and several of these things uh, have uh, not been uh, covered in, in, in many of these uh, sort of fences that is done. And this statistical uh, exclusion uh, is a serious issue that I just want to highlight. And this is again a kind of a, 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 another kind of a compilation, uh, which again shows that what a, what a diverse variety of numbers and that you have from different sources talking about just the uh, it is a kind of estimates on artisans uh, as we get from different sources. So the, this is a sector uh, about which uh, I think if at all we need to do something, I think first immediate policy attention that has to be paid is to sort of conduct uh, the kind of detailed census of both the handlooms and the handicraft. And, and we must necessarily uh, in larger variables. It's not just enough to know that how many uh, individuals are uh, involved, but I think also we should know about the technology. We must know about the markets and the varieties of uh, uh, sort of information which about which I'll be talking very soon. But then, uh, given the uh, sort of time constraint and uh, given that I sort of, uh, I thought I'll sort of take you through uh, some of these, uh, uh, what uh, some of these spaces of uh, artisanal production to, uh, to get you a certain kind of a sense uh, of, of what really sort of matters. So I'll, I'll, I'll take you through maybe very quickly, sort of four uh, such clusters uh, about which uh, I have uh, done some field work. Uh, I mean, I've I done field work in several others, but just I thought I'll give some four uh, quick uh, sort of uh, cluster ideas uh, to tell you uh, that that what kind of constraints uh, are, are being faced. So we are first talking about the Terracotta uh, cluster in Molela in Rajasthan. Uh, it's a kind of a very uh, significantly it's a very well-known uh, cluster. In fact, it has got the GI certification about 400 year old, and they sort of uh, use uh, sort of local uh, clay, uh, so local techniques of uh, making whatever and uh, sort of like uh, figure items and certain kinds of small little uh, artifacts, uh, which are sort of like initially uh, sort of uh, made uh, like this in the uh, small little houses of uh, these artisans. So, and and this is also this entire village, uh, which is sort of engaged in this. They have. Uh, uh, there, there is very little uh, bank support for them. There is very little civil society engagement, uh, and and the entire uh, thing that they are manufacturing. So they are as like essentially brittle products. So very little effort uh, to help them in packaging, in marketing. Uh, given the fact uh, that they have received the, what is called the the GI uh, uh, certification, I will sort of move a little faster. And even if you are talking about a kind of a, what kind of incremental innovation. Uh, that you'll be sort of imagining for such uh, activities which engages local people. There is a demand for these products, but then maximum maybe you can think of as I've shown here, uh, like uh, on, on the on the top two, uh, essentially the, the local raw material, the, the local technology available, maybe using a fan, and maybe maximum you can think in terms of sort of putting a little paint as done by one of the sons of the artisan family as an MBA student, and he thought that why not put a little bit of a color to that. And that's all that we can sort of think of. And this is, again, a very, uh, si sorry, a state of affairs. Like as I said, this is a cluster which has received uh, the GI certification button as we were sort of doing the field work. We found much of this uh, papers lying in the uh, in the public, what you call the dust uh, bins uh, of the village. So there is very little initiative taken after uh, the GI certification uh, was given or whatever little training was given. And even today, uh, near the, this cluster is very close to the Srinathji temple. So, uh, so these are sort of sold in the open. So this is how sort of we finally treat our uh, artisans. Uh, we, we have done very little in terms of supporting them, uh, sort of marketing their products uh, and even providing certain kind of uh, uh, like financial support. And the other issue, which is kind of a generic, I mean, I'm just through this specific case study, I'm trying to sort of convey that. I mean, a large number of uh, sort of craft products are, uh, in fact, uh, so, I mean, so they are based on a variety of natural resources, mostly forest-based. It's whether it's stone, it's a reed or a metal or uh, a wood, and so it's a variety of such, certain kinds of clay. So these are the kind of the, uh, sort of resources on which these crafts are based. But then, uh, like as in the case of Molela, uh, this entire uh, region where this clay was sort of freely available to the local uh, artisans, uh, uh, the entire region has now been taken over uh, by the private real estate owners. So the entire craft and the, the skills, the people they remain, uh, but the raw material is no longer available. So this is very true for several such, I mean, I've done similar work in, in Zulakhamundi 
in, in Odisha, for instance, which is sort of based on certain kinds of horn war and uh, those uh, sort of raw materials are no, no longer available. Uh, there have been several such questions regarding uh, raw material banks. That's what uh, I sort of initially was trying to hint at. They must think in terms of uh, certain kinds of infrastructural support. So sort of seeing this as a kind of a real uh, business uh, enterprise. So let's quickly go to the bamboo craft cluster in Barpeta in Assam. Again, sort of kind of a very, uh, very specialized cluster based on local uh, resources with some uh, uh, state's uh, support, of course, and the, the products are absolutely mind-boggling. And these are sort of human hands uh, from bamboo uh, created fantastic products. But then uh, uh, we also know that there is very little marketing uh, support that they receive. And also in terms of certain kinds of technology uh, input, which would have sort of enhanced the productivity uh, of uh, of the workers and particularly sort of by let's say to sort of introduce a certain kinds of a machine which sort of let's say brings out the sleevers the sleevers from bamboo in a, in a much faster uh, manner maybe in a much more uniform uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, what do you call the sleevers uh, are received from uh, uh, by using a, a, a small machine but there is very little uh, sort of banking support which is available uh, to this craft person. In fact, as I once talked to uh, one of the top uh, bamboo craft uh, sort of entrepreneurs of Tripura. Uh, in fact, he was he was one of the recipients of the president's gold medal. I I I, I remember. And so his main point was that there is very little uh, sort of support for certain kinds of basic uh, sort of mechanical or electrical uh, gadgets, uh, which would have sort of improved their uh, business and maybe improve their productivity. And at the same time. Uh, we can we also come to the question of what about uh, like uh, the, the initiatives like Surti, for instance, uh, which is a kind of a central government uh, uh, initiative uh, for the traditional industries sort of creating certain kinds of what are known as the common facility centers or kind of a sort of uh, kind of small little facilities, a kind of a workshop, for instance, uh, where uh, where these craft persons would come and work. And this is uh, in in Barpeta, uh, there is very little. Uh, Use is made of uh, this uh, uh, craft uh, facility, uh, the, the common facility center. Uh, so, so these are actually uh, so then it's not just enough to have a scheme, but also to ensure uh, that uh, that the local artisans are actually uh, using those facilities. I sort of uh, take you to another cluster in Gujarat. This is the kind of a this is the Suzuni uh, quilt cluster. It's a kind of a traditional cluster, largely uh, uh, in fact uh, largely done by several Muslim uh, local artisans. Uh, at some point, I think they were also uh, exporting. Uh, so the so what I've shown this, this is a kind of this is another uh, state uh, sort of sponsored uh, a cluster, a rural craft uh, cluster, uh, which sort of uses a certain machine as I've shown on the right side. But as you visit this place, uh, so that you are, uh, and we are told that uh, there are something like 418 artisans are uh, are engaged in this cluster. Uh, we are also told that something like 247 lakh uh, rupees uh, uh, has been sort of sanctioned by uh, the Spurti for, uh, for for setting up this uh, common facility center. But as you sort of go there, uh, you find it's a totally different scene. And excepting for the machine, the junk machine on the left hand side, as you can see in brown. Uh, so this is actually absolutely a modern uh, power loom uh, unit, which is sort of I mean, outside the board says uh, it is a craft, uh, what you call a common facility center for the uh, Suzuni craft, uh, uh, Suzuni quilt, and uh, inside it's a, it's a fully uh, mechanized. Uh, in fact, uh, it's a kind of a very uh, a high end uh, power loom sector which sector produces uh, sarees uh, uh, and. And, and this is uh, how it sort of uh, looks like. So this is uh, so these are again sort of larger uh, policy uh, issues uh, that it is not just enough that even on the ministry website uh, you have information about this cluster. Uh, as you sort of move around, we found very few, in fact, practically almost no one who is engaged in this craft. And this entire common facility center uh, is being used for manufacturing sarees uh, for, and as we are told, maybe. And for some particular uh, organization uh, in 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 Rajasthan, uh, so and uh, so what you have uh, in the in the in the picture uh, below uh, that is uh, so those those are the Sujini clusters and that is very little uh, that is being manufactured. So there are sort of issues uh, not issues of uh, issues of in fact 
uh, inspection, uh, there are some issues of ensuring that uh, the, the local uh, artisans are involved, issues uh, of what kind of markets and whether uh, these spaces uh, sort of officially designated uh, for a certain craft, whether these spaces are actually not used for the same purpose. Uh, so that uh, sort of brings us uh, to one more, uh, maybe this is the fourth and the last cluster I'll be talking about. I'm sort of showing this for, for a specific region, because unless you get a sense of uh, a sense of uh, the, the functional dynamics uh, of these uh, sort of clusters or of these crafts, uh, it will be very difficult to talk in terms of what kind of uh, sort of institutional innovations that one, one is talking about, what kind of constraints they face, and it is just not enough to talk only about some kind of basic data or or talking about so sort of like providing a certain kinds of basic minimum support services uh, as done through some marketing uh, support as uh, often uh, provided by the state. Uh, so this is a this is another cluster which is so sort of largely sort of focusing on uh, what is known as this Kolapuri uh, chapel. So this has been there for a long time. The local tanning is done so using local uh, resources, local skills, and so largely uh, sort of uh, largely uh, for a long long time. Uh, this was sort of targeted by the local traders who would sort of buy these products at a much a cheaper rate. Uh, and the, the local producers got very little. And this is also the place where you have a kind of a huge uh, uh, sort of workshop or a, a huge uh, common facility center, a kind of a workshop uh, set up by the CLRI, the Central uh, Leather Research Institute of the Central Government. Uh, so that is very unusual that in a very such a small place and for such a small uh, craft, uh, that the center has set up this for maybe it has been there for last, I don't know, 30, 35 years or so. And this central uh, unit uh, has uh, done so very little because uh, the entire uh, facility uh, of the CLRI uh, is all about how to make books. But this is a, this is a cluster where the, 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 the real local product is Kolhapuri Chapel. So this Kolhapuri Chapel has nothing to do with the CLRI uh, Institute, which has been there for such a long time, and I'm quite amazed uh, that how we have not really thought uh, through this. Uh, that how you have a kind of a, uh, a kind of a central government uh, institute there, which has so very little to do with even the product that the local people are doing. And then in the same place, you have kind of a, another uh, sort of civil society organization uh, called ASEN, uh, sort of which, uh, which 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 was in fact led by. Uh, the very well-known Madhura uh, Satrapati, the, who received the uh, Women Entrepreneur uh, of India Award uh, some years back. And so it is through her organization uh, that a lot of, sort of new inputs and the, what you may call it, the soft skills as well, like how to sort of manage the business, how to manage the finance uh, of this uh, craft, and also how to create newer designs, some kind of a product and process innovation, uh, which are sort of instilled. Uh, into uh, this local uh, craft uh, sort of region, uh, which was essentially doing a certain kind of uh, what you call as you know, the, the, the Kolhapuri uh, chapels. And now uh, with these new designs, uh, a new branding, uh, the, the brand called uh, Tohol. Uh, so the, the local entrepreneurs, uh, they have really transformed uh, their lives because these products are now sort of exported to a large number of uh, countries. And something like more than 600 new designs uh, have uh, come up using same local resources, same local craft persons, and same local skills because they have gone in for little diversification. They have been sort of sensitive to the needs of the global market, and these are the sort of essential inputs uh, which probably we need to rethink if we are talking about promoting a certain uh, craft. So these are some of the pictures uh, from there, and these are just some of the. Uh, very, very few, in fact, as I said, more than 600 designs uh, of the Kolhapur Chapel, but then comes, uh, I've sort of shown a few of them, and uh, sort of suggesting that it is very much possible to have a complete rethink on what kind of intervention that you are talking about. It is not enough to have a common facility center where no one goes. It is not enough to talk in terms of providing a certain bank loan and be satisfied with this. It is a business. It is a livelihood proposition. So if you are talking about promoting this, we better think in terms of what kind of market that you are targeting. If you have not really identified the existing and the possible markets for these products, and if you have not really identified what kind of soft skills that must be sort of imparted to the local artisans, it is not just enough 
to provide a GI certificacy. That's my context. So it is, so I'm, I'm, we are, we, 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 we provide a GI certificate certification, but at the same time, you, you have no sort of loan for sort of buying a little small machinery, which might be sort of uh, helping in sort of improving certain kinds of, let's say, certain kinds of processes. So if you have not done that, I think we have not really understood this sector very well. So let's very quickly, given the positive of time, I'll very quickly sort of take you to what others have been doing, not very far from us. I mean, let's say some of the Asian countries, I mean, they have tried out what is known as in Japan, for instance, in 1961. Uh, so this idea came of so promoting one village, uh, one product, and a later of a different uh, kind of a based on that, but then with slight uh, some modification, the one thumb on one uh, product idea, which uh, sort of came from uh, Thailand. Uh, you may uh, also remind me of what about the order one district, one product. I will not talk much about that now because I think you really have to see what kind of, so it is not just a sectoral approach that one is talking about. So there is a variety of interventions which sort of includes uh, sort of collection of kind of a detailed data for instance, like for instance in Thailand. So they have engaged like college students during their holidays to collect data from the village enterprises. And sort of, and we have uh, here a situation where, as I said, that for the handicraft, we know nothing about that sector because there is no such information available. And even if I take the data from, let's say, this Furti, uh, so which sort of tells me there are sort of 359 uh, clusters. And as I said in the beginning, uh, there could be something like 6,000 clusters. That was some estimate made some years back. And if you take the AHVOI, the Ambedkar Hasta Silt Vikas Yojana data, that covers about 744 uh, clusters and says that there are just about a little more than 2 lakh actually. So the, the point is, even today, we have not really even covered all the clusters, craft clusters in this country, and we have not really thought in terms of what kind of sort of uh, a varieties of, sort of incentives that we could be providing, how we can sort of like improve the marketing uh, potential of the craft products, for instance, like as I have often uh, sort of in, in my, some of my earlier presentations elsewhere, I've mentioned that like using up, let's say, uh, uh, under the OTOP, for instance, and the using of the Thai airways, uh, the Thai embassies to, to promote uh, local uh, sort of uh, rural uh, products elsewhere in the in the country, uh, uh, elsewhere uh, abroad. Uh, so, so there have been several such uh, initiatives which have been taken, and I think we really have done so very little. And this is uh, another sort of uh, example, again, from the Asian country. This is mainly from uh, South Korea. Uh, so like, as I sort of discussed with some uh, scholar uh, a few years back in China in a conference, uh, sort of like he was talking to me about uh, how they have sort of used this whole uh, digital uh, technology to promote certain kinds of services, not just the manufacturing products, certain kinds of cultural services. And so they have found eager uh, markets uh, for them. So we really have to, and then that also leads me uh, to to the to the other uh, so relatively recent example of uh, what are known as the Taobao villages uh, in China, where in like in the remote areas, remote particularly those who are the people who are engaged in certain kinds of craft, uh, sort of products or certain kinds of traditional services, uh, how sort of they have been creating small little videos and contacting directly with the customers across the globe, because because the state actually has provided then high speed uh, 5G internet connectivity in any of the remote parts of the whole country. So unless we are thinking, I mean, we have not even thought in terms of providing electricity to enterprises, and we, we, we have not thought about providing high speed internet connectivity. And I think we have also not thought in terms of a varieties of infrastructural support, uh, which actually lies at the base of uh, promoting uh, these uh, clusters. And uh, apart from that, uh, I think, uh, as I sort of did uh, mention a little bit earlier, uh, there is also a kind of a uh, need for providing certain kinds of knowledge inputs. Uh, and uh, so what kind of uh, sort of uh, certain certain kinds of skills, uh, particularly uh, sort of relating to uh, managing finance, comprehending, uh, um, uh, comprehending uh, procedural aspects of exporting, patenting, uh, certification, uh, and then accessing certain business development services, linking with other similar business or cluster associations elsewhere, there has to be a variety of this kind of sustained uh, initiatives, uh, which I shall call as the knowledge uh, input. That brings me almost towards the end of my presentation. I will not take more than two more minutes, maybe. Uh, and sort of like what kind of 
uh, craft policy we are talking about is in terms of if you are saying that there has to be some institutional uh, innovations, uh, I think uh, the policy must necessarily focus on fostering the capacity of artisans to negotiate effectively with the market and effectively protect their own interests within a situation of constant change and unrelenting competition. And if electricity has to be provided uh, to sort of uh, to to hasten or to improvise the, uh, the, the certain kinds of processes, I think that needs to be done. If roads have to be provided, that has to be done. And there's sort of very very broadly sort of three uh, kind of uh, initiatives, if I may propose. Uh, and this is to, to one relates to the raw material uh, centric aspect of it, like in terms of certain kinds of supplies of raw materials, as I said, mostly based on uh, natural resources. Uh, so, so they are on the decline. So, uh, so maybe creating uh, raw material banks for them, uh, and what kind of support that could be is provided. That is one uh, such uh, initiative that could be taken. The other thing is that uh, how to access a kind of a wide variety of markets beyond the local, and sort of which sort of adds value. If that if that means that you really have to go in for diversification of your product, that has to be done. And what kind of support needs to be given in terms of marketing uh, elsewhere? including in the global uh, space. Uh, and then certain kinds of, uh, uh, like uh, this whole uh, question, which we did not quite say, but then it is so much a part of uh, this sector, is this whole thing about informality. The informality, which probably uh, sort of walks down uh, the capacity of the craft uh, enterprises to access certain kinds of benefits of the state. I think that probably needs uh, to be uh, addressed uh, very much. and. Uh, we probably need to rethink uh, the craft as a sustainable uh, livelihood option. Uh, it is not a poverty eradication program. Uh, it, it is not something that we, we sort of give an hour to a craft person and be done with that. And it's not enough to talk only about culture, heritage, uh, and, 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 and feel very happy and proud about it because, because we have for decades sustained uh, and been very, very uh, negligent about what I described as subsistence industrialization. We, we think that the artisan is a poor fellow, needs a little bit of support, and that's it. So we have rarely thought in terms of recognizing, promoting, protecting, integrating them into the mainstream, and to ensure that this is a sector with some support, with some imagination, with some innovations, product, process, and institutional innovations, may this may be the major source of local employment, local income, maybe local pride. That comes later. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Das, for this very illuminating and uh, thought-provoking presentation, which uh, I'm sure has also, uh, you know, created concern in most uh, most of our minds about uh, this, this serious issue, which needs to be addressed. If you agree, I'll just close the presentation. Yeah. Yes. So just to go to some of the questions that have been coming in, we can start with uh, P.P. Sahu. He says, sir, what are your views on ODOP? In some cases, disproportionate attention has been put on one or two products of the districts and pushing all others to the margin. What are your views on new scheme, PM Vishwakarma? How one can think of good support system or policies for this sector without any data set. Partha, I'm very happy that you uh, asked this. Pipi Sau is, is Partha Patip Sau, uh, a friend of mine. Uh, so I'm very happy uh, that you asked this, and I also know that uh, you are concerned about rural uh, enterprises uh, at NIRD, uh, and you are much closer to the policy uh, circles. But then. Uh, like, uh, I do not want to sort of elaborate much uh, now, but then uh, as I sort of soared through the two very dense slides of mine on OVOP and OTO. So that tells you how different it is from uh, from the, the initiative of OTO, which I'm not saying that OTO is a bad idea. But then I my simple point is that 
if you take only a kind of a subsector approach, that is sort of you are focusing only on a certain product uh, and sort of like celebrating, as already you have said that maybe there are other products in the districts which have been sort of sidelined. That is one aspect of it. The other thing is infrastructure. So my actually one of the key key focus uh, about the sector uh, is that you cannot really talk about promoting the sector uh, without focusing on business infrastructure. As we have we have been concerned about the urban areas, as we have concerned about let's say the modern uh, small scale industries, for instance, uh, you you have done so much for the export processing zones, if I may say so. And what is that we have done uh, for uh, for these craft sectors in terms of water, electricity, internet, uh, sort of like uh, designated uh, areas and sort of linking them to the let's say the the, the, the design centers, for instance. So we have like. If I may sort of quickly compare this with a, let's say, a kind of a modern and a very successful cluster, let's say, of, of the ceramic tiles in Morbi in Gujarat, uh, and you see what kind of efforts are coming, and they are sort of doing so very well globally. Uh, in fact, they have really sort of uh, been exporting so much. So why can't we think about uh, the craft sector? I mean, we, we, we have thought nothing about packaging, for instance. I mean, you sort of see... I mean, you, you, you go to the Otop shops in, in Bangkok's uh, uh, airport, for instance, uh, so there's so very well-packaged uh, artifacts which come from the rural areas, and the packaging also done by the rural uh, people and using local resources, and you are ready to pay much higher price. So I would imagine some initiatives like that and a bit of a clue from what I sort of also quickly mentioned about the Athani footwear cluster, uh, so the kind of giving, uh, you have a brand uh, name for that, and sort of like explore what kind of global uh, demand is there, even if that includes that you have to diversify the product. So those are the some of the uh, policy initiatives. Maybe we can talk later, but please. Yes. Okay. Then another question from Caroline. How do the craft clusters work? Is there anything for artisans for collectiv collectivization similar to the way farmer producer organizations work? Uh, there have been uh, initiatives by some private uh, like uh, groups. In fact, uh, so, uh, these are the kind of a, uh, a non -for non farm uh, product uh, collectives. Uh, particularly, uh, if you uh, if you sort of uh, uh, there have been some initiatives uh, in Bangalore, uh, uh, for instance, uh, and uh, but then. Uh, it all depends, uh, like even if you take, let's say, Fab India as another uh, example. So there have been sort of like sporadic uh, initiatives like that in which, uh, uh, but then you are talking about certain kinds of products. Uh, you are talking about, uh, let's say, uh, maybe you're focusing on uh, a kind of a small number of artisans. Uh, that probably uh, is not addressing several issues facing certain kinds of what we are describing as the languishing. Uh, sort of uh, clusters like if you see a book called Handmade in India, uh, sort of which sort of lists uh, some of these languishing uh, clusters. Uh, so you'll find that maybe uh, they need it. So this needs a much uh, much larger uh, uh, initiative, and the collectives and to the AHVY that is the Ambedkar Hostel Vikas Yojana, uh, there are in fact they have formed a large number of SSGs, something like eighteen thousand five hundred seventy eight SSGs have been formed. Uh, but I don't think the, the SSGs are the only answer. Uh, it, is, it is very important that we collectivize them. But then also in terms of ensuring that the raw materials uh, are available to them on time and the profit is uh, sort of equally shared. That is a larger uh, concern. We do not know really uh, whether uh, these collectivities, the private collectivities, uh, whether they are sharing the profit with uh, the artisans uh, in a regional manner. So that is the only concern. Thank you, Professor. There is another question. Craft is not only about livelihood, although it is important. It is an expression of our values. How do we protect that and not only make it economic? Uh, yes, and that no one, uh, no one, I don't think anyone will dispute that it is about values, it's about culture, heritage, of course, yes. And sort of like it's also an expression of our traditional knowledge. Uh, so, so, so there is no question about that. Uh, but my point is slightly different. Like, if that is so, 
then should policy come in or not? If policy has to come in, then it has to be seen as, and if you are talking about a certain values or certain tradition which needs to be sort of kept for the next generation, uh, so you really have to, uh, because the, the, the craft sector is essentially produces certain kinds of goods and services. So unless there is a market for that, uh, and so the, the artisan sort of has a dignified uh, livelihood uh, option, uh, all our ideas about uh, values and um, uh, whatever, whatever, I, I think I, one is not sidelining that, but then one is saying, you cannot, can you be happy with only values and you have no income to support your family? In fact, we know of several, I mean, many of these craft surveys, which I have not reported here, have uh, done several surveys across the country, and many of the uh, craft uh, person's children, so they would not get into this ever. They are looking for jobs in Bangalore in the in the IT sector. So what can we do for them? Actually? Unless you make it a kind of a really uh, profitable uh, livelihood option, it, it's kind. So that is where I think we must come in. And the examples of over port of that I was giving that actually creates that new opportunity. In fact, unless you create new markets for them, uh, you are not going to get uh, much uh, value for that. And only by focusing on sort of like glorifying a certain past and not doing anything about that. And sort of, we have nothing, we, we don't worry about the crafts which have been dying. We have not worried about the crafts which have been languishing. We know nothing, we have no information about that. So what is the what is the pride that I take as an Indian when, uh, when I have no clue about how many crafts are there in India, there is no statistical information. Are we not uh, to bother about that? Those are my questions, please. Thank you, Professor. There are two questions related to the rela relation of the sector with knowledge. Maybe I'll take the first one. Do, the, do those in these traditional sectors have their own system of education and skill development? How can the scientific base be strengthened so that they can better adapt to changing global market conditions? Then there's another question, which is how is innovation and knowledge generation among artisans captured and codified? Um, I think that's uh, uh, in terms of uh, engaging local knowledge. Uh, I think there has been, in fact, there have been, I, I must say that there have been some efforts uh, done at the state level. Uh, to engage the craft persons. I mean, the craft persons, irrespective of whether they have a formal degree or a kind of engineering qualification or whatever, whatever. Uh, I think there have been, uh, so this has been taken on board. And I think that in itself uh, is, a, is, a, is a major input uh, for enhancing knowledge and sort of like sharing uh, knowledge amongst the, uh, the amongst other uh, artisans. But at the same time, uh, I also think uh, that accepting for uh, kind of initiatives in GI, geographic uh, indication uh, initiatives. Uh, I think we have probably, uh, we have not even followed up on uh, several uh, GI certification, whether that has actually led to the intended uh, benefits, like whether uh, actually there have been some new skills generated or whether we are talking about only just one workshop done by the Chennai center in some village at some point, and then everything has been forgotten uh, or, uh, or in, 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 in several such uh, instances, uh, we also need, uh, as I did mention, certain kinds of uh, modern uh, inputs. I think that is something which even uh, someone like T.S. Papola in the 80s, uh, he had been talking about when he was talking about rural industrialization. Uh, so he was actually mentioning this. So I think at some point, we really have to, and also this use of internet. And as I'm talking to this, let me also, I, I forgot to mention about that, this whole very interesting case of the uh, Gems and Jewelry Export Promotion uh, Council, which is again a very, very, sort of handicraft uh, or handwork uh, centric uh, sort of sector in this country, they have been doing exceedingly well. And the state has been of great support and they really have a sort of like wide basis, whether in, in, in the Eastern India, in Odisha and in, in West Bengal or in Tamil Nadu, in, in Coimbatore area, for instance. And they have been sort of like linked to the global market through a very direct support of the state. Uh, and uh, they have ensured that certain quality standards are maintained uh, certain products are patented. Uh, so I would imagine uh, a kind of an initiative like that, uh, probably. I mean, that is just one stray example, but I think they have done extremely uh, well in uh, sort of like promoting the product as well as 
uh, ensuring that the knowledge around, let's say, designs around new markets, uh, so those things also have uh, come out. Thank you, Professor. Uh, there is a, uh, there are a few more questions. Um, how can the craft sector coexist with increasing mechanization? Will they eventually be phased out with technological progress? In other words, is it, uh, does one see a long sustainable future for this sector? Um, uh, or is it is it a question of uh, a stopgap arrangement till the population catches up? I think that is the question um, that Jen. Uh, uh, I, I I appreciate this question because it also at some level I mean I see this as an existential uh, issue. I mean, so like it is always a kind of a trade off. Um, but uh, let's uh, let's take examples from several uh, other countries I mean, which also have rich uh, crafts of their own. Uh, so they have, uh, in fact, uh, even when they have taken recourse to certain kinds of modern technology, including the information technology. So I would not, I also gave a little example uh, in my slide uh, to use of uh, IT for certain kinds of services, for instance, like music uh, as one such example. Uh, so I would think that uh, we cannot really stop that. I mean, you cannot stop the modern technology sort of making inroads uh, into your, uh, let's say, heritage uh, domain. Uh, but uh, I would sort of argue that to the extent uh, it enhances the labor productivity, to the extent it enhances your market reach, and to the extent it doesn't compromise with your values, uh, I, I would imagine, and, and to the extent, uh, maybe it, it, it's kind of a, what I sort of call as the inclusive uh, innovation uh, ideas. Uh, so to that extent, it is possible uh, that we, we may have to allow for certain uh, modern technologies to come in, but then we have to be careful uh, that that doesn't destroy uh, the craft. And the, one of the major threats, as you know, might know, like, for instance, the Mahesuri the sadis, for instance, uh, or uh, let's say sadis made in Sambalpur, for instance, so which are sort of great uh, examples of our uh, uh, craftsmanship for, for, for ages, and which still have market, but there is also a huge duplicate uh, product market in that, uh, like in, in Agra, for instance, you'll find uh, the same prints of Mahesuri Sadi uh, being sold uh, at a much, much cheaper rate. So those are the areas in which, actually, those are the institutional innovation that I'm talking about, like how to prevent this kind of duplication, uh, sort of how to sort of ensure uh, that your, your like designs are uh, copied, but then sort of like it compromises the whatever, the integrity of the local producers. I think these are also the issues in which uh, uh, initiatives uh, have been taken. Uh, Professor, this is a question from my side, just building on this uh, question that was asked. So if one thinks about it in terms, again, this is a policy uh, implication. What is the core value in of this uh, sector? Is it the fact that uh, it is hand you see, it is it is done by human labor. Uh, is but is there an what, intrinsic value in that, uh, or is it the creativity that uh, that labor acknowledges? Is it um, that it is sustainable? I mean, one can look at different uh, um, uh, lens through which, uh, uh, or different value lenses through which, or it is one could say it is a it 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 is a source of livelihood which you know sustains a certain way of life. But if one had to make policy decision, what would be the core values that one would try to uh, you know sustain about this sector and not lose in the process of. Um, rapid transformation, which all sectors are basically under. No, I think the, uh, the uh, this is the, definitely the core value is sort of like respecting uh, the dignity of human labor, human intelligence, uh, skills, and also the imagination of uh, the humans uh, to, to make a, a thing a beautiful by using certain local uh, resources. Uh, so, so, so there is no denying the fact, and in that sense, we are not like 
not necessarily comparing that with any modern uh, uh, sort of products. Uh, but then we also recognize historically, uh, so this kind of products were uh, essentially made very broadly utility based and certain kinds of decorative purposes, uh, like the things which are in, in, in the background of uh, uh, on your wall. Uh, I'd say, um, there is very little uh, utility maybe, uh, but then it has a very, uh, it, it looks so very beautiful and it is something which is um, made of craft. So I think, so there is no denying the fact that there are uh, individuals, you call them buyers, you call them onlookers, you call them people who appreciate uh, certain kinds of human activity. I think that remains at the center. But then to the extent you think it has to be kept alive, uh, then uh, I think uh, you, you you need to uh, invest. Uh, you need to see that as a little business proposition. If you please allow me, I'll just give you one or two very quick examples uh, to tell what I'm trying to uh, convey. Uh, please allow me about two, two to three minutes, maybe very quickly. There is something called a filigree, silver filigree, uh, which is very famous in Katak in Odisha, and it has a Persian uh, origin, etc. And so very sort of fine. Uh, hair-like uh, sort of silver thread uh, with which they make a lot of ornaments and for decorative pieces. It's a great mark. So when Ronald Reagan was the president of the United States, I was told, and I was told by the Odisha Chamber of Commerce in an interview, uh, that sort of he came to know about this product and sort of wanted to. Uh, he belonged to the Republican Party and the elephant was the symbol. So he wanted to sort of uh, uh, gift uh, tie-ins with like uh, silver filigree type ins with uh, kind of an elephant uh, there uh, to be uh, manufactured here in Katak and to be given to, I don't know, some thousands of uh, party workers in the US. And that is, there was a kind of huge demand which was to come from a craft product, if you like it. And then when it happens, when the demand comes, so there is so much of chaos because the first thing is, as someone asked before, that there is no collectivity. These are all individual artisans. So they would not come together to sort of like address a single demand. Uh, and then there are also issues of what kind of uh, silver, uh, what is the quality of silver, what character of silver, whether we can sort of, we have to import it, somebody suggested it has to be imported from Madagascar and all that. And then about 300 such uh, sort of uh, craft persons, they come together uh, and after maybe about two to three months, uh, they just simply not uh, work in a manner which would sort of comply with the standards in terms of space product specifications and also in terms of the time of delivery and also the quality of the silver. So then finally, it sort of all falls off. I'm trying to say so that maybe, maybe that little thing would have made a huge impact in terms of the demand for or kind of a visibility of this craft product and might have given sort of sustenance uh, to a large number of craft persons. But then because we have not really, we have often seen this as kind of an individual, uh, sort of like a kind of artisan-centric activity. Uh, so we have not really built any institutional support system Sort of promotes the cap. So I would imagine that uh, those uh, inputs must also come in while we are very concerned about the values uh, ingrained uh, in this craft. And no one is denying. And in fact, we are all very proud, as I said in the very beginning, we may be having the largest number of craft uh, clusters in this world. But then we have no information on that. So what is the pride that I take? I, I talk about a thing and about which I have no further details. The state provides me no information, and I'm talking about promoting that. I'm very worried about that. That is my concern. Thank you for your response, uh, Professor Das. Uh, there are two more questions. One is at the beginning, uh, Chandrasekhar asks, why is the data poor if this sector is so important? I mean, 6,000, you had mentioned clusters exist in the country. Even that figure, I mean, it's it's to be. But why is there, what is the cause for this apathy, uh, you think? What is the main cause for this neglect? Uh, I, 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 I really do not know the exact answer, but I would imagine that as I also did very, I mentioned in the passing, I have some papers on this, maybe I can share, uh, that I think from the second five-year plan onwards, when we sort of focused more on the heavy industries, and then we always thought that the small industries we like it or not, they would be sort of working as the appendix to the large industry. So they will be essentially producing for the large industry. If that was the larger industrial perspective, industrial in development perspective, then the artisan sector is not going to support the, the large enterprises in any way. 
so i think that was one of the major major ways by which we sort of like distracted from this uh, sector and also i would imagine that there was very little that we thought in terms of uh, sort of this as a kind of a potential livelihood option that this could create business jobs i think we never imagined that uh, we always thought oh this is a very beautiful uh, item so i go to a little heart and i buy uh, some product from another state and i feel very so it, it remained at a very very so that's why i call it a subsistence industrialization that was the expression i used towards the end uh, it's almost like the artisan is a poor fellow and just has to earn just enough uh, to survive for maybe one or two meals for the family so we have not really seen this as a productive uh, a kind of a respectable uh, way of livelihood Uh, which uh, the state uh, definitely had to promote if you are talking about a kind of huge rural sector a uh, huge uh, traditional knowledge base uh, and we talked so much about msmes but we we i think we we always thought that they should probably support the large scale industries i i think those are probably the areas in which uh, we have missed out uh, professor two more questions before we end one is uh... So slightly, uh, the, he says communal issues or politics are also penetrating the handloom handicraft industry. There was a recent report on the Banarasi weavers, seventy percent of whom were from the minority community. They believe they believe they have suffered in the last few years because of lack of policies, of course, but also because of belonging to a certain religion. What, according to you, could be done to keep the harm? emerging out of such biases at bay uh, uh, this is this is one of the most uh, dis- disturbing aspects of uh, the craft sector which again has been very little addressed though we know uh, that certain kinds of crafts particularly like i i, I know of uh, like the leather uh, the crafts involving uh, leather uh, leather production all that whether in kanpur or in calcutta uh, in several such places so several processes Uh, are done by different caste communities, whatever, whatever you call. Uh, and uh, it is it is truly sad uh, that we have a situation in which when we are sort of glorifying a certain craft, so that craft is not it, it, it's like a Bollywood um, a music, you see. So the singer may be a Muslim, the the musician may be Hindu or whatever, whatever. But then at the end of the day, uh, you and me enjoy that music. So the some many of the craft products are like that. So these are not always sort of produced by a single community or or a single household. There are several processes uh, which are sort of conducted at different uh, by different uh, communities, and uh, I really do not know what uh, needs to be done about that. But I think uh, I think maybe more studies uh, to highlight uh, this uh, discrimination, and within that, uh, if I may also add. Uh, like the the whole sidelining of women, for instance, like women artisans, and they are the ones who have received practically no recognition uh, in this uh, that their contribution has been there. Uh, I think uh, as part of the institutional innovation that I should mention as part of my title, uh, your uh, suggestion of uh, recognizing the roles of certain communities and maybe a kind of a gendered role, if I may say. Uh, so those things have to be uh, center stage and maybe through. Uh, more and more examples. So that's the only thing I can say. Thank you, Professor. Uh, so the last question, I think we can take conclude with this. Chandra Shekhar S. He asks if you had to suggest three main interventions at the level of policy, what would they be? Uh, I think that was my last slide. Uh, <laughs> one was uh, the raw material centric. Uh, I think uh, the the institution centric. Uh, and certain kinds of uh, infrastructure, I and mean, so those are broadly. So my only point is that if if, if you are concerned about this sector, you better do it in style. Uh, you provide electricity, you provide infrastructure, uh, you sort of you you provide soft skills. Uh, so all that has to be done, uh, and ensure that the craft persons, uh, the original people who are engaged in this or who have the knowledge, they are at the center of activities. It's not that a kind of an engineer comes from somewhere and I suggest I don't think uh, that is uh, what's needed, and the other policy input which I again mentioned throughout uh, sort of includes uh, certain kinds of modern technological inputs only for certain kinds of processes, uh, but very selectively 
uh, intelligently that has to provide that i think uh, would be some of the basic things and of course one one of the largest policy inputs if at all we must do uh, the census of handicrafts just now so there is no discussion uh, without that information uh, base uh, so no policy uh, is going to help us without knowing uh, anything about this sector actually Thank you so much uh, for this uh, very enlightening and thought-provoking lecture, Professor Das. Uh, I think it has, at, at least for me, and I'm sure for our listeners and participants and those who will uh, watch this lecture when it is uploaded on YouTube, I think it definitely has uh, not just raised our consciousness about uh, the reality of this whole sector, which, as as Professor Das pointed out, remains shrouded in ob uh, obscurity, but has also um, thrown light on the potential that exists uh, if this sector receives systematic and uh, uh, thoughtful attention from policymakers, researchers, civil society, the state. Um, I'd uh, like to thank everyone who has joined us and uh, contributed to this uh, rich discussion today. Uh, thank you again, Professor Das. I hope we have an opportunity to benefit from your learning and knowledge again soon. Uh, thank you so very much, Professor Aras, for giving me this opportunity. I also thank everyone who has raised interesting uh, questions. Maybe some of them uh, I have to really sort of think through. Uh, and uh, with that, maybe uh, we can uh, have a little uh, a better uh, future uh, for this sector. Uh, it's a very promising sector. I think somewhere uh, we have uh, sort of sidelined them. I'm very thankful. Uh, it's a great opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone.